Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm a huge fan of B-Sides since I met B-Sides uh, just about six years ago now. Uh, any organization or humans or individuals willing to provide access to really important training at no cost or low cost, I'm happy to support it anytime, even a Saturday on a beautiful fall day. <laughs> uh, I hope all of you are having a good time and uh, getting a lot of um, great knowledge, and I hope you also get to get outside and get some fresh air. It's a gorgeous day. That being said, we've got an important topic here. We've got an hour together to talk about uh, you and us as humans and how uh, important uh, EQ is to our careers and uh, really our happiness levels. So I'm gonna dive in. I'm gonna dump a lot of data on you, uh, a lot of great stories. My content comes from, uh, you know, a long quest for uh, understanding and uh, always analyzing why humans uh, do what they do, meaning what uh, behaviors they uh, place into society on a daily basis. Uh, ever since I was a, a very young girl, I thought about uh, why would somebody do that? And uh, and it's been a part of my journey <laughs> throughout my whole career, too. So uh, now know that not only have I studied this topic because I've been fascinated with it and as I majored in sociology and criminal justice, and I also um, do a lot of thinking about this topic because I'm responsible for so many people and have been in my career my, since a very young age, responsible for other humans. And luckily, I was trained by very high emotional intelligence uh, individuals. I worked for them for 21 years and got to work across three different companies. And, uh, and so I get how rare my story is too. And, uh, and so I really uh, seek to give uh, to you all because uh, as we know, not only at work, but all around us, there's a lot of upset uh, in uh, people being uh, emotionally upset and um, it's not a lot of fun. <laughs> and so uh, much like RBG, uh, we all can have the skill of persuasion through verbal and written communication. We can. It is a skill. It is absolutely a skill. And it is as important as your hard skills, your IQ skills that get you your technical skills, your your ability to understand compliance and law and, and um, you know, the inner workings of uh, the technology that we use and that's very very important and it's really never about one or the other it's really about understanding that uh, EQ you know our ability to really uh, understand how we think feel and perceive and how others think feel and perceive is critical for happiness it's critical for uh, teamwork in completing projects and uh, uh, it's critical for e the ability to uh, create equality which is uh, a quest that humans have not conquered in any capacity yet and yet uh, each year <laughs> believe it or not and certainly since the since the uh, era of um, farming and access to food and water in a greater capacity our brains have developed our um, part of the uh, of empathy and the care for others and so I firmly believe that uh, should we choose to keep our conscious minds understanding that we have uh, an obligation to a skill set of, of emotional intelligence, we can create stronger cultures, we can create uh, teams that stick together and uh, enjoy work, love work. Uh, of course, this content works at home too. Uh, <laughs> it is uh, universal and yet, uh, you know, I tend to speak a lot more towards the workforce considering it's been a passion of mine uh, since I got into the workforce, building teams, uh, uh, enabling teams for high levels of success, doing that with high levels of love, you know, money and love, that can happen, yeah. Yeah, it really can actually. And so uh, so that's what we're gonna get into today. And uh, my ask of everybody is to um, take this very seriously. Uh, the, the, the fact that this is a skill, 
It's not a desire. It's actually not uh, even just a concept. <laughs> it's uh, these very factual skill set that falls under emotional intelligence. So let's own it, right? All right. So if my if my uh, ask of you to own it for humanity so that we can all live, you know, uh, happier, uh, more togetherness, more equality, well then, um, understand that capitalism is also saying you must own this, meaning the uh, stock market. Um, you know, has determined that uh, organizations that have high level of emotional intelligence skills are uh, more successful and therefore they will do better and therefore more money is put into those organizations. It is now a known fact that uh, the treatment of humans matters to the level of production that happens. It doesn't mean that production uh, can't happen without being nice to other humans. It means that best case scenario is when people are nice to each other, work well together, encourage each other, uh, support each other's mental safety, that more creation comes. And so uh, your incomes are tied to your emotional intelligence. There are plenty of studies that show how much more money people make that are emotionally intelligent. As you can see here in this study um, uh, done by uh, Google, that uh, the more successful, i.e. the more, high, more higher ranking individuals, that's more money, right? With more responsibility comes more money, have higher emotional intelligence and 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 that came out by you know more equity in terms of how they treated people equally more generosity more curiosity more empathy right uh and so my point is to say that um capitalism has realized whether we like it or not we're playing in capitalism uh our our careers and while we are cyber security lovers we uh, we get paid to do uh, what we do. And so uh, from that perspective, people want more. Organizations want more out of all of us from the emotional intelligence piece. And yet there's not a whole lot of training going on. I mean, how many of you, how many of us have got sent to training of this capacity? Uh, it's pretty rare. And that's a problem. That's a big, big problem because we're working in an era of more and more teamwork. You know, I remember in the early 90s is when I graduated college and getting into tech and uh, on the staffing side of things. And, you know, the question was, you know, does this, is this person going to interact with anybody? Like, that was a question. Is this person going to interact with anybody? Is it, meaning, like, the majority of the time they don't, but maybe your job's different. Let me check was how I was trained at 22 years old. Uh, that, that, that question is ridiculous today. And granted, that was 30 years ago. That, you know, how ridiculous of a question. And yet, I can tell you that one of the things that we hear right off the bat from almost every client is I want a good communicator. I want somebody that can communicate well. And uh, it's, you know, who doesn't, <laughs> you know, who doesn't. And so that's why I'm saying to you all, take the time, recognize that not only is it good for you, uh, it's also good for organizations to uh, empower emotional intelligence skills and skills training and um, participate in it, get it, meaning ask for it, get, you know, ask to be put in those types of training. Situational leadership's a good one. Just even understanding Myers-Briggs is a great one in terms of, you know, how you and others in the organizations, um, you know, ought to be thinking when interacting with each other. I mean, there is training to be had. <laughs> um, and I, and again, to iterate even more why we must do this. I mean, look at these statistics. I mean, I tell people all the time, uh, I'm about retention and, and yeah, I own a staffing agency and yeah, that's what we do for a living. And yet I don't need everybody changing jobs every 18 months to make a living. I don't need that. I don't recommend that. I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying that changing relationships, you know, every year and a half or two years is a lot. It's a lot of emotional distress 
finding the job, having the breakup with the organization in general, whether it be a layoff or a quit or a, just a, 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 a even worse situation, it's not fun. And these statistics tell us that we're not really enjoying working together. And, I, and that bothers me. Again, as I mentioned earlier, having the luck of finding these two serial entrepreneurial men who hired me out of college and trained and promoted me within their organizations over a 21 year period. And it wasn't just me, that was their program. They are the founders of Rapid7, which is where I got into cybersecurity in 2007. And yet, you know, my point is that this kind of treatment of training and promoting from within or just training in general is not high out, uh, you know, in the industry, although I'm banging that door and I'm going to make sure that people listen a little bit more about succession planning and training, not a little bit more, a lot more. Certainly they are We're seeing some progress. And yet this is still the, the, the statistics. And so uh, we've got to say, well, you know, what can we do, all of us, whether we're in a management seat or we're not in a management seat? You know, in my organization, I, I say I, everybody's a leader. You're a leader. You're entry level. I just hired you or you're at the C-suite and we, you just joined. You're a leader. But a manager is different than a leader. A leader ought to act, you know, um, powerfully positive and a, ought to, you know, a manager has to, because a manager is creating these statistics, meaning uh, people typically leave people, not not typically the jobs, uh, and it's all about how people are being treated, and so if you're responsible for my career, then, then uh, that's, a, that's a huge responsibility, and therefore uh, we really have to measure managers intensely on personal competency, social competency in the workforce. It is not okay to be a manager, again, defined by responsibility of the success of somebody else, which we all know that, you know, whoever one reports to, there is a lot of power in that report structure. And so it, it, it can't be taken lightly, lightly by organizations and it can't be taken lightly by anybody who's in a management seat. And that's my message to you. Please don't be in a management seat if you're not interested in the well-being of others. If you're not interested in a mentorship type relationship, if you're not interested in really thinking a lot about how others feel and how they think and how they proceed if that if that doesn't interest you well then don't don't get into a management seat. you can still be a leader in an organization by the way you carry yourself and you can still have great jobs great jobs subject matter experts are leaders to be responsible for others is is really a serious thing and so I, I ask us all to take, to take this very seriously at the management level and think about and be self-aware such that you can self-manage. There is no such thing as perfection. And yet there's also a, a, you know, a high possibility of being pretty close to perfection in terms of how we treat others. I mean, there really aren't many excuses other than I'm human and so once in a while, <laughs> I'm not on my game. That's, you know, really about it for me that exists. And so that means, yeah, I have to make sure that my brain is being powerfully fed. Uh, that's everything down to what I eat, to my exercise and my meditation plans, meaning I have to care for myself if I'm going to care for anybody else. And I, I learned this the hard way. I was, believe it or not, 28 years old, making ridiculous money, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, 310 pounds and barely exercising. High level position of vice president of sales. And all of a sudden my health was not my friend. And I said to myself, wow, how can I keep going? How can I show up for everybody if I can't take care of myself? And I really went into this place for others 
thankfully, and for me, I do more, you know, I do things because I want others to respect me more than, uh, you know, sort of it's healthy. <laughs> Meaning, what was I thought to myself, what am I saying to all these folks that I'm mentoring and training and developing? If at 28, my health is so yucky that it's impacting my ability to, to show up. And I thought, and smoking cigarettes, I'm killing myself, and this is what I'm bringing. So my point is, you know, when we really care to show up for others, and we understand that they're looking up to us because we we're in control, a pretty big piece of their livelihood, then 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 there's a there's a there's a, a you know just a, a responsibility to care for yourself to have self-awareness for yourself so that you can show up for others and you can give what they need. Because a lot of what management is, teamwork is, uh, you know, whether they're, you're managing people or not, it's to show up in a way that allows for, the, for, for, for people to feel mentally safe in conversation, in discussion, to get to project you know, completions and, and the results that everybody wants. And that's not easy to do. We're going to talk about it in a few minutes in terms of, you know, what it's like to make and manage measurable agreements out in business. It's, it's, there's a lot, there's a lot to that that will allow us to manage our emotions uh, better. Meaning if we can, um, you know, manage agreements at a high capacity, of, then we're going to have less fallout, less, less trouble. So, 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 you know, when I look at personal competence, social competence, you know, social competence is in business too. It's not, it's not your social life. It's interacting with society. It's interacting with others, right? So how do you interact? How, how do you interact? And caring about that is good. Caring about how you are perceived by others is good. Caring about how others feel about you is good. Not caring, caring doesn't mean having anxiety over it or, or beating ourselves up, up, up over it or having guilt. While we all are capable of having those emotions, I encourage you to recognize that they're not powerful and that those emotions can slow you down and that your EQ is, is ever evolving. It actually doesn't cap out. Uh, IQ caps out as the brain fully develops. EQ actually can continue. It can continue your entire lifespan. So instead of beating ourselves up or feeling bad about a situation, let's own them. Let's learn win-win communication in making and managing measurable agreements. Let's let's own that. That that in itself will allow us uh to learn and um and also you know sort of succeed at the same time meaning the learning doesn't have to be that we you know the the, the stove's on fire you know <laughs> like it doesn't it doesn't have to be the worst case possible that that um got us to the learning experience and so i want to talk i want to move into this segment of making and managing measurable agreements because the number one thing i see and I've seen throughout my entire career, and again, working with tons of organizations over the years of building teams, you know, what I do, I, uh, I see that 90% of the time when there's an upset, when there's um, a breakdown in relationships, which is people moving jobs typically, you know, or um, dealing with projects that didn't go the way they were supposed to go, there's always, always a lack of making a measurable agreement or managing the measurable agreement that was made weeks, months prior. And so I find myself talking about this all the time because I think to myself, wow, if we can eliminate this breakdown, then the harder stuff, the stuff that um, is a little bit more of our programmed mind and, and con unconscious bias minds, we'll, we'll have more time to spend there. We're, where uh, we can um, really work at bringing in uh, equality and, and equity into the workforce in terms of how we treat people. So, so I, I say, let's, let's, let's take this off the table so that we can really own relationships. So, what do I mean here? 
So just about all of us uh, on a regular basis, we're making agreements. <laughs> I shouldn't even say just about, we're all making agreements on a regular basis. There we go. And uh, let's, let's recognize that when we're making agreements uh, at work, that um, typically it could be an email, it could be a drive-by conversation, it could be a sit-down meeting where we're making agreements. My point is we're making them all the time and sometimes we don't even know that we just made an agreement. And so I'd like everybody to really think about when you're, work in the, when you're working and somebody asks you to do something, how you're responding to that and where does it fit into your other agreements that you've already made because the worst thing that we can all do is break agreements meaning i told you i would have x y and z done by x y and z date and i didn't do it that's not a good place to be it's not something that's respected highly in business but what the interesting thing is i hardly ever see that and you know why I hardly ever see that? It's because the agreement isn't measurable. It's pretty rare that a human knows, I'm going to be responsible. I'm responsible for this. Yes, I've accepted it. I Yes, I've accepted it for this day. And then that date just comes and oops, I forgot. It's pretty rare. Home, humans, you know, we don't show up to work to fail. It's not our goal. I remember being very young in my management career. In fact, my first uh, trainee ever uh, and um, we had had a you know an instance in the office where uh, he wasn't listening and I got really frustrated and uh, it was an open bullpen environment so of course my my mentor heard the conversation and later that evening you know we were having a drink he said listen nobody comes to work to fail so figure it out He's, uh, you're training him. Why, wh wh where was the disconnect? Why wasn't your message getting through? What were you doing? Let's think about it. Let's look at it. Like nobody comes to work to fail. So uh, thank goodness that human said that to me at such a young age because it's never left me in that I got it. Yeah, right? Like who comes to work to fail? I mean, uh, and, and, and I'm training this person and it was my communication that wasn't landing. And it's my job to have the communication that lands. And it was a, a great learning experience. So if we make agreements measurable, we probably won't have a misunderstanding is sort of the moral of the overall story that I started and that I don't see most agreements measurable. So let me give you an example. Somebody asks you to do something, say, yeah, I'll try to do, I'll try to do that. I'll try to get that done this week. Well, as you're going to hear later in my talk, the word try is such a terrible word that um, I'd like to, us to eliminate it from our vocabulary because sometimes that statement of I'll, I'll try to get that to this week, get to that this week means I'm going to get to that this week or I did get to that this week. And sometimes that statement, I'm going to try and get to that to that this week is I tried, but I didn't get to it. <laughs> and um, and depending on you know, who's saying it, when it's happening and all these things, that could be a problem. If somebody interprets it as I'm expecting that this week. And so we really got to eliminate words or situations that keep us from making a measurable agreement and uh, stop ourselves, slow ourselves down a bit to recognize that we all sort of rely on each other. And so if we're um, making an agreement, it needs to be really clear so that everybody can move and make their moves and how they need to move around the project and that that is a skill and it starts from getting how much we rely on each other and then it and then it goes to you know being successful at work in general really requires us to care and so i i uh I would love for you all to you know. Even put your thinking caps on for a minute and think about these last few weeks at work. I bet you, you can find a situation, whether it be with yourself, maybe somebody that works with you, for you, around you, and um, seen an, an upset that happened, and see if you can chase it back to an unmeasurable uh, agreement. I think you're going to see that that's 90% of the time. And uh, that's not easy to make a measurable agreement. 
I'm not sitting here saying that's a super easy thing to do. And it actually has nothing to do with ego. It uh, has to do with, uh, you know, w things that we don't know, you know, uh, we can't, the, the, the unknowns, we, we uh, make an agreement and we think we know everything. And then we start working within that agreement. And all of a sudden we think, you know what, I don't know. I actually am not gonna make that date or um, you know, I don't think it's possible. Well, it's at that moment that one must uh, inform the others that are a part of that measurable agreement that there's a concern about the dates, that there's a concern uh, based on having learned something new. And this is where it really matters. Meaning, look, we're all taking on big projects you know, I just, I just heard somebody on my team say to say to his team last week, uh, you know, how long will it take you to get me this? And uh, the response was six weeks. And his response was, I want it in two. And it's like, we we can want things all day long. Is it possible? You know, and and if they agree to the two weeks and they get two days into it and they know it can't be two weeks, well, then at that time, they need to speak up because they agreed to the two weeks, even if it's five days in, even if it's seven days in, it doesn't matter. We may think that we all made good agreements. Again, I don't know if they accepted that agreement, um, but uh, you know, we all make these agreements and then we go do our best and we think, yeah, we could do this in two weeks instead of the six and, and then we go do our best. And the, but during that process of doing our best, we know. We know that date's not possible. That's where we must speak up. And when we do, we can eliminate so many challenges. When we wait till close to the date, or even right before the date, eh, it's not something that people like. I don't like it, why? Because I know, I know there's no way you just figured it out the day before. Now, if there is a situation like that, of course, great. But it's not very often that happens that we're sort of figuring out the day before something's due that we're not going to have it due. So my point is to say, do you have measurable agreements? Is your job function measurable? Because if it's not, what ends up happening is politics, egos, finger pointing, blame, and the most powerful wins. And I say, you know, like, let's just be gone with those days. So if you don't have measurable agreements with those that you work for, make them. You know, it's one of the things I love most about situational leadership is that it really teaches us all, and this situational leadership's been around since the early days of manufacturing. A uh, very uh, talented sociologist, a uh, doctorate of sociology, and that's brilliant. It's a it's a brilliant program. I encourage you all to check it out. Uh, it what it really teaches is the ability to manage up, and and it it teaches a lot of these things that I'm teaching. And, and it says that if you're not getting that from above, then you bring it above. Too. And I couldn't agree more. We, I came into the same sort of training with those, the, the folks that I work for out of college and, and for 21 years. And so, um, you know, this is uh, not necessarily easy in that to make something measurable. It requires time. It requires thinking. It requires quiet to really think about, you know, getting something done along with the other some things we have to get done on a regular basis. That's that's a lot of time management, understanding, understanding distractions, understanding what things could get in your way and could come in and, oh, yeah, by the way, it's COVID and a lot of pe people have kids at home, right? I mean, like you really have to think about these dates and you have to plan for sort of some unknowns. And that's a skill in itself, right? And then, and then we're all working within a capitalistic environment, which means hurry, 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 things faster, 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 like my... I want it in two weeks, even though you told me it would take six, you know, uh, you know, uh, example. And uh, and it's and I literally was trained to to you put the wings after you jump, right? And so I know, and I do. I put the wings on after I jump. I am that entrepreneur, and yet I can still make measurable agreements. 
with one caveat. If I can't make a measurable agreement, I make a measurable agreement to make that something a measurable agreement when we can. Meaning I get that there are sometimes, it's particularly in starting something anew, uh, making a measurable agreement is during the research process could be um, not possible. So make a measurable agreement to sit down and make a, a measurable agreement after the research in terms of what that date is or what have you, you know what I mean? Ultimately, this comes back to you, high level of communication with the people you're in business with, the people that you're on a team with, the people that rely on you every day and you rely on them. Those people, you must own the ability to make measurable agreements and then manage measurable agreements, okay? And this will take 90% of the chaos out so I encourage you to spend the time. I encourage you to, uh, you know, ask for these types of training. Like I mentioned, situational leadership to have it be brought into the organization. I have it brought into mine, and you can do the same thing. And it's it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. All right. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, which was we're going to talk about some words. I talked about the word try, because when I think about emotional intelligence and I think, again, about the upset that's going on and, and, and how people are moving jobs so often due to just everybody being on the same page at one moment and then not being on the same page at, an, at a very another moment that's not too far uh, on the on the time spectrum, which I I, I think it's not good for society. A lot of what comes down other than measurable agreements is how we speak to each other, our actual words, our actual words. And so while well, we'll have some fun with these five words that I tell people, just eliminate them from your vocabulary, like eliminate them. Uh, they bring no value, really. Um, beyond, you know, having some fun with these words, fun meaning it's quite interesting when you actually, when we actually talk about them and we will, but really we want to be thinking about all of our words, all of our words. So I can't make you feel anything necessarily, meaning your mind chooses your emotions. It was the most powerful thing I learned. I learned it when I was 33. From that day forward, I wished I had learned it when I was three uh, or 13, you know, or 23. You know, you pick the number anytime earlier would have been lovely. Uh, and the reason being is that I grew up in this, as I'm sure many of you did, that, you know, my relationship with you is 50% my responsibility and 50% your responsibility. And I really believed that. And it wasn't until I really sought training and having some difficulty in relationships that I was told that's not, that's not the way that it works. It's not 50% you, 50% the other person. It's 100% you. Meaning it's 100% my responsibility to have a relationship with you. It's, if I want to have a great relationship with you, I can have a great relationship with you. If I don't, then I won't, meaning like that's your that's your power. I can't make somebody else have a great relationship with me. And yet I can create a great relationship with you. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So here's my here's what I'm saying. If I want to have a powerfully positive relationship with you, then I would choose my words so wisely that I could. And that's the name of the game. That is the name of the game. You know, uh, when I first heard of, of RBG, it wasn't too long ago in my life. Just, just a, a shamelessly to say, you know, three years ago maybe. And and then I studied her furious, furiously, fiercely because I realized that. Of course, she's an amazing, amazing woman, you know, fighting for equality and, and certainly for women. But what I really found fascinating was her, how she used words. And I started listening to her, her um, cases and uh, certainly the ones she presented to the Supreme Court justice. And it's very clear. And of course, that is what, you know, sort of litigation or law is. It's words. 
it's literally words. And so while I can't necessarily make you feel something, there's enough knowledge in society that based on the words I choose, I can pretty much create an emotion that I want, right? I mean, isn't that what's happening with social media right now? Isn't it, isn't it true that that like button brought us all joy? And then over time it brought sadness, but you, you know what I mean? Like it's addictive. It's addictive, that feeling, that good feeling. Well, you, you know, creating a good feeling is something that a human can do with words for another human. It's very true. And, it, and it's the same with a bad feeling. And so what I'm saying to you overall is I believe words are the most important uh, weapon that we have. And when I say weapon, I say it because I think we use words mostly to the negative in um in, in in terms of creating environments that give people you know mental safety it's not a lot of that that goes on so while these words may you know are are, are kind of uh trivi trivial to the game there's other words and 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 how they're put together that are much more serious and so i'm asking everybody to really think about their words own their words you know this words um, not really mattering anymore. You could call that fake news, right? Words being put out into the world, whether they're verbal or digitally, creating something fake. That's um, that's a you know a real serious issue for society. And so what I'm out you know just begging the world prior to you know sort of these last four years even is to take words seriously because they start wars and they end wars. They can be used for good and they can be used for extreme pain. And, and should we choose, and there's the word should, because there's only one, the only time you're supposed to use should is when you want everybody to do it for sure. <laughs> uh, is should we choose, I'm hoping you choose, to um, think about your words at such a level that you're literally making time in your day to think about how you're going to speak to others. And, uh, and that's, that's required to have uh, good EQ skills is the time to actually think about how and what you're, what you're going to say. All right. So that was, let's have a little fun with these words and then we'll get into um, some more skills in uh, EQ. Uh, uh, I want us all as conscious as can be about skill or uh, words. All right, let's let's finish. Try we. I gave you the examples earlier, you know. Uh, but one of the best ways to to illustrate how useless the word "try" is is just drop a pen on the floor and try and pick it up. You know, you either pick it up or you don't pick it up. There actually is no in between, and this is why the word "try" just brings a lot of headaches to the workforce. There's a lot of people say, I'll try and do that. I'll try and do that. Okay. So let's just get rid of try. Um, should is an interesting one because a lot of you are in security operations and there are emergency situations and that is the only time. And that's what I was referring to earlier where the word should ought to be used is an emergency situation, a, a training dictating situation that everybody needs to do this. Otherwise, using the word should really stifles people's ability to think and look at a situation at a 360 degree view. And what are all my options? One of the places that this is aired the most is uh, somebody who is a manager, somebody who is a mentor, a parent. You know, you should do this. You should do this. You should do that. That's not helpful. Well, I know that people think it is. And while I know that people uh, have the best intentions, that doesn't mean that the best result is created. Meaning, if I look up to you and, and, and you're telling me I should do something as it pertains to my career or something in life that we're discussing, and I don't want to disappoint you. That's a burden. That's a burden, especially uh, you know, being that typically a mentor has, you know, is much older and, you know, sort of has been through much more. It's hard to, 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 to say, may go, go against that. Or even a parent. I mean, how many people I've met over the years that my degree isn't really what I wanted. I did it for my parents or, 
you know, um, same thing with just sort of career advice, you know. And so what I ask of everybody is, is instead of telling people what they should do, tell them what they could do. You know, offer options. Help everybody, you know, sort of look at and understand all their options because there's lots of them. We all can do whatever it is we want to do. That is the truth. The reality is that humans can do whatever they want to do. So you can be in one division of security and get to another one. Yes, you can if you want to. Yes. And um, when we empower humans with options and the ability to think through them and what would that option create and what would this option create and and certainly hearing from our mentors or our parents or our friends and what they think without the burden of you should which implies that if i don't well maybe i made a mistake and that's not that we don't need that in the decision making process we don't we, we don't need to put that on people while they're making very important decisions in life right? We need to empower them with knowledge and options. And, and if we'd like to share our own thoughts about um, why the one path or another seems, you know, smart to them, you know, yeah, carefully, carefully. But really, if you're providing all options, you don't have to be persuasive, you know, it isn't true that we know everything, all of us. <laughs> it's true that when people can look at something and, and see all of the, the options, they make really good choices. So let's, let's, let's go with that. All right. But, but is the, the worst word on the screen. If you choose to eliminate one word, please eliminate the word but. So, in that training, and I told you I took, you know, back now quite some time ago, uh, almost 20 years, um, this was the second thing that I realized when we were in the language portion of these, these trainings, which, by the way, it did for years. Um, understanding how much the word but changes uh, the, the, the sentence to actually have no value or no meaning was mind-blowing and it bothers me every day it's one of those things like i'm so glad i know that i know it and yet ah, i see it everywhere all around all around our, our our political leaders our mentors leadership you you listen to them speak and the word butts in the middle of a lot of sentences a lot of sentences and i'm sure by now even though i haven't said it you've figured out what i'm talking about because you stick the word but in the middle of a sentence you are negating the beginning of the sentence and it is the most common way to not be authentic to not be accountable to hide to lie and it is the subconscious mind that does it the most and we have become a but society uh, uh, and, and, and it's bad. It's super bad. So, um, I want to empower us all to a recognize this, like, listen, listen, when people speak, listen to w when the word, but comes and say to yourself, huh, the first half of this sentence was this, the second half was this, they're the opposites of each other, because that's exactly what it is. And so, how does one really know what's the truth of what that person feels? Holy moly, that's terrible. It's a terrible thing and it plagues us. And I see it, I see it out in the world and I see it in business, you know, uh, way too much. So let me give you a, a, a small example. I just finished a presentation and I'm, standing in front of the group of you know team that i'm giving a presentation my boss is in the audience and my boss says great job Deidre. what happened to the part where you were gonna um, give us our seo numbers do you think i heard great job no no because if, if that person wanted me to hear great job the sentence would have went like this Deidre, great job. 
the sentence would have been over. We would have made eye contact. It would have been a smile. Great job. Thank you. Great job. And then, you know, let that land. Let me let me know that you actually thought I had a great job. Otherwise, don't tell me I did a great job when I didn't because I missed your SEO stuff. Otherwise, just say, no, I'm really disappointed. I, I thought this presentation was about uh, SEO or had the majority of it was going to have SEO content. Where is that at? You know, that would help me more than than sort of like this this feeling for a second of good and then, oh, shit, or, oh, my gosh, what happened? You know, and wait, is it good, not good, not bad? You know, again, this is very, you know, sort of, um, you know, to highlight how easy it is to send a, a, a mixed signal just by putting the word but. All I have to do is say, great job, Deidre. That was awesome. How, what, what happened to the SEO data? Like if it was really awesome and I just left something small out, great, okay, it's on my mind, I'm a leader, right? right? If I'm the, if I'm the, you know, my leader sitting out there listening to the presentation, DJ did a great job, that's awesome, but why, I wonder why she didn't put that SEO stuff in there. I was actually really looking forward to see that. But that, but they really thought I did a great job, then all they had to do is say, great job, DJ, that was awesome, thank you, that's exactly what you wanted. Um, uh, I noticed the SEO uh, content was wasn't in there. So do you have that? Do you have anything you can share there? You know, like that's going to support me in knowing that I did a great job. Otherwise, don't tell me I did a great job. Okay. So the word "but" is used a lot, and um, unfortunately, because the word "but" is used, uh, people in in general don't really know where others stand, and they get disappointed often. Well, I thought they I thought they thought they believed this and then they did this and it's like no you just had a sent you heard something that had the word but in the middle of it so you really didn't know which one it was <laughs> uh so this is a fun one um you can um you can send me at any time any uh examples you get because i always love hearing them and i'll tell you when you're watching politicians and leaders listen listen for it it's pretty mind-blowing and let's uh, let's teach our, uh, ourselves and others to just lose it, lose the word but. All right, obviously, I chose obviously to make in terms of my my top five because the word obviously when used in business meetings is probably the the most electric word that one can use, and I laugh because even for myself, if I'm sitting in a meeting. And somebody says the word obviously, it actually makes my body sort of wake up. Never mind, has it already sort of <laughs> attacked my mind? Uh, meaning, like, what, what? Why is this person saying the word obviously? What, what? What? What just happened? You know, like that means, you know, that they're smarter than, or that they 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 think something is, um, you know, should be obvious to everybody. Meaning, like. You can see it in a room when some when when people use the word obviously, others take it as a, a, a pretty negative experience. And so, um, <laughs> uh, again, what value does it have? You know, even if something is obvious, why start a sentence with obviously? I don't I don't I don't see what value it brings. If anything, it's gonna possibly turn somebody off from listening at a great capacity or caring at a great capacity because it's, um, you know, not, not a positive sort of way to start a, a conversation. You know, I get that there are times where the word obvious is needed. Again, obviously is much different <laughs> than obvious. Obviously assumes you should have known something you didn't know, or I'm going to tell you something you definitely, you know, probably, don't know or or you should know but i'm thinking you don't know i mean it's just it I, I i can tell you that i've had many of complaints of people over the years of if that person says obviously one more time so part of it is it's a filler word in communicating and part of it is a, a bit of an ego thing so whatever it is it doesn't bring good fa good feelings into meetings i can tell you that so it's by the reason it's on my list here all right the word fine, uh, this was a fun one to learn, uh, meaning 
so so I was I was trained that the word fine. If I ask you how you are and you say fine, it it's really the sign that you're not interested in engaging me and giving me something to work with, some, so, something to uh, communicate back and forth. I mean, you're not you're not really interested in a conversation. And um, and when I first heard this, I thought, huh, that's interesting. I really hadn't thought about that. And then I started really paying attention to at work when people say I'm fine. And I realized that the majority of the time, if not all the time, where somebody says, when I say, how you doing? And, and turn, again, what in one of my cultures, you know, hey, how are you? How's it going? When somebody says the word fine, it typically means something's going on and and they're they're consumed by it and they're stressed by it and they're not fine <laughs> they're actually not fine and i'm sure you know that uh that's not all the time and people are rushing and what have you but it is a high percentage and so um the reason i say eliminate it from our vocabulary is because it really causes us to disconnect to not connect to not share and when you find yourself wanting to say it, just like in any of these other words, I encourage you to find another word. It's not, it's to, it's to allow yourself to communicate in a way that will really get you the most powerful experience. So you're going to replace these words with another word. And it is true, the more we can connect with the people we work with and connect with people in general, the greater capacity we have to create, the greater capacity we have to enjoy life, the greater capacity we have to affect others and ourselves positively. So, so you know, by saying eliminate these words, if you, you're, you're about to say I'm feeling fine or thanks I'm fine, maybe that will trigger your brain to think, huh, how come I didn't want to connect with that person? How come I didn't want to engage them more? What's that all about? you know uh and 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 really that's the message of overall of all of these words and words in general why'd you use it why are you using it you can use lots of words choose your words wisely care that your words uh can affect others such that you're creating the most powerful win-win conversation you can all right we're counting down on minutes here. I've got uh, about three or four minutes and then we'll take a couple of questions here. I wanna end with this. So EQ, emotional intelligence, are skills. These are, these are the emotional intelligence skills that I train on, have been trained on, continue to train on, created lots of them material. Uh, and, and, and what we talk about in our organizations. And that is um, to recognize that these skills take just as much practice as your 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 high, your hard skills, your technical skills, your your legal skills, your compliance skills, right? These skills have to be worked at. And so, in our organizations, we have these trees printed out with this on it. So, you know, meaning like keeping it conscious. Our conscious minds are a very par small part of what we do every day. And so you got to keep your conscious mind awake. Otherwise, you're just going to rely on all your old skills. Let's create new skills. Let's keep them growing. That's your conscious mind. So visuals, super important. Have visuals around. Understand that these are skills. Like it's a skill to have a positive attitude, meaning life's hard. This, I'm super in tune with society and I, I every day I, I know I have to be positive and yet I see the most negative stuff all day, right, in, in, in the world, it's meaning I, I stay in tune with that stuff. And yet I come to and, and I show up with a positive attitude. That's a skill. I've worked at it. I've trained at it. I was told when I got hired out of college that it was my job that I was being paid an entry level salary to bring a positive attitude every day, to bring in, in, uh, a being interested at attitude every day, and to implement the training that I was given. And those three things were measured of me. And, 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 and thank, thankfully so. <laughs> thankfully so. They gave me a great foundation to work from because everybody loves positive attitudes, right? Everybody loves when, um, you know, uh, they, they can, they can um, show up at work and there's a positive vibe, that the culture is positive. Like we all want that. 
we, in fact, we all want the same things, which is kind of crazy that we haven't created equality in society, meaning who doesn't want to be treated with respect? Everybody wants to be treated with respect. Everybody wants to, you know, make equal income. Everybody wants training. Everybody wants, you know, to be, to be uh, treated uh, fairly. Everybody wants equal opportunity, you know, opportunity to grow and progress. And so if we all want those things, then um, why wouldn't we make sure that those of us in power make sure that others have them? Well, there's a lot of reasons as to why, and yet it doesn't mean we have to accept it. We need to, we need to change that, right? Willingness to confront others is on here as a skill. That's a, that's a skill. Like, you know, um, probably most of you were brought up like me to think confrontation was bad. Well, guess what? It's not bad. It's actually love. Like to confront somebody, which means to actually talk to them. That's all it means to engage them, to talk to them, to to share with them what you're struggling about, to to let them know you're upset or or what you got going on is actually love. Because if you're willing to engage somebody, then we can actually create solutions. If I'm not willing to confront, then nothing can happen. No, nobody, no solutions can can be created. And so it's actually the, the lack of confronting that is that is the problem. And so we must be willing. We must be willing to talk to people even when it's uncomfortable and to engage conversations, meaning we must be willing to externalize our internal communication, we must be willing to put it out there so that it can be um, dealt with in a, in, in, a, in a way that allows us to prosper and grow and, and, and move forward. And we only learn by doing it. So on that note, I am out of time here. I'm going to uh, say to you all, if anybody wants my EQ tree, please and put it up in your office, please do. If there's anything I can do to help you, let me know. I'm super involved with a lot of organizations supporting diversity and cybersecurity. I've made a slide here with a lot of them. I encourage you to get involved. By getting involved with our community, we can create change faster. And so please do. And I've also, uh, I know a lot of people come to uh, B-Sides maybe getting into jobs for the first time into cybersecurity. And I want to say to you all that there's a lot going on in government jobs. And I encourage you to apply to them. And so I made a slide here of where you can go find those jobs. And even if you're not entry level, you know, I apologize, even, even not being into entry level, there's great jobs here. So please do check them out. All right, and um, here's some resource links of great organizations that I love uh, and adore in training. And uh, here's my contact information. Thank you all so much. And let's see if we've got some questions here from our lovely moderator, room moderator. Perfect. Thank you so much, Deidre, for the presentation. It was awesome and greatly informative. Um, we do have a few comments in the chat here, um, especially regarding uh, words that empower us. So a few comments here, absolutely right about the word should, um, demonstrates lack of vision and context. Um, a lot of fantastic points to consider, bring back to my work. Um, thank you for the great talk. Um, I actually had a few items myself um, that you spoke about that really resonated with, with me and I thought was really interesting. Um, a few of those points, EQ doesn't cap out like IQ does over time. I found that very interesting. Yeah. Uh, people, people typically leave people, not the job where they are working. Um, I think that really resonates with with people as well. Um, I really like this uh, point you made. If you don't have measurable agreements, make them. Um, and if you can't at that time, have a date for a date. Um, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, uh, words are most words are the most important weapon we have. Um, and this one is always interesting. People with higher EQ uh, make more money. Um, <laughs> that's a, a, a great comment there. Yes. Yeah, you um, great. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, I did have a question for you. Um, you know, just personally over the years um, within uh, employment, um, I see, you know, even browsing in LinkedIn, a number of individuals working at jobs for one to 
one year, uh, maybe even two years, if that, uh, and moving on to a, a new position outside of their current employer. Um, do you believe this is due to, you know, from, from what you've seen um, in, in your company and workings, do you see this as individuals seeking to, you know, kind of leapfrog to uh, have higher compensation, or do you see it's more so relatable to their workplace environment causing uh, the talent to leave? Yeah, it's such a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it because really everybody needs to know it's not the money. It's not the money. Nobody comes to us about money. Nobody starts conversations with us about money, meaning when we're pitching them jobs, it's not like, well, what's the money? It's what's the job? What am I going to be doing? And what has happened is a couple of things. One is cyber is uh, has not caught on to the succession plan planning train yet, you know, like all other departments typically have. And that's because there's a lack of budgets. And um, so because of that, people have to move to kind of keep their careers going because there isn't this succession planning in most organizations. And then the other piece is, yes, the people. It's just not a place where they're enjoying working. It's one of those two things. And sometimes it's both. And that's what's so horrific. Now, I will tell you this. At the offer stage, once the offer, it comes down to the offer time, of course, everybody wants more money. Like it's risky to make the move. It could be the same problem, even though they say it's not. In fact, the majority of us, the more we move in our careers, we realize, huh, I need to die, you know, check this more. Like, are they really have what I need? Am I really going to be able to grow? Like the last company said so, and then it wasn't true. So now I'm going to dig more. And so, you know, the reality is, of course, it's risky to make a move. And so everybody wants a raise as a part of that, making that move. Um, and they usually get the raise. And so that those statistics can kind of be like, oh, it's the money. No, 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 I'm telling you. <laughs> it, doesn't, I, I, it doesn't matter what the money is if they don't think the people are awesome and that the job is a good fit for them. It, people aren't gonna make a move for that. And so there's a, there's a lot of hope that it's a better place, you know? And, and the, problem is, the problem is it really hasn't been. And it breaks my heart. I mean, if you think about it, if a chief information security officer is changing jobs every 18 months, is which, it, which is what the statistics are showing, well, then how much chaos is underneath there? It takes a year for a CISO to find a job. That's eight months they're on the job and they're not loving it and they're looking. So how's that, that like, what does that create? Not, and I don't blame them because they're usually told that they're, you know, they're going to get to, have, you know, build a security program and then they can't. You know, so I don't, it's not like I don't blame them. I'm just saying, like, imagine what it's like, how much chaos that creates. So we got work to do, my friend. <laughs> no, absolutely. Very, very valid points, especially from a C-level perspective and even, you know, junior analysts as well. You know, the time frame that it takes to to wrap up a, a replacement is, is, is crazy. It is. Um, we have another minute or two um, before the next speaker um, joins. I, I do have another question for you. Um, in terms of the words that you talked about that disempower us, um, what are your thoughts about saying sorry on emails, for example? Um, I've seen tons of times where uh, work just gets so busy and you know individuals may not be able to answer to an email within a day or two, maybe even three at some times. Um, and I consistently see folks say sorry in emails. Um, do you think this is a word that disempowers us? You know, I think that sorry disempowers us when we're using it and we could have avoided having to say it. So for instance, that making a measurable agreement and then managing it, if I knew ahead of time and I could have told somebody, and um, then I wouldn't have had to say sorry. You know, or if, I, if, if I'm saying sorry and I could have avoided saying sorry, it's not genuine, it doesn't land, and it's just not a good idea because it just becomes this habit of, of a way to have an excuse for myself. But if I'm genuinely sorry, and maybe, and, and for me, I'll tell you what, if I don't respond to an email in 24 hours, I'm, I'm usually like, sorry, like I feel like I'm behind, you know? And even though the person may not be expecting it from me, I might say, sorry to be so behind, because I'm feeling it. Like I'm, I'm sharing that I'm feeling sorry that I didn't respond to her. So, you know, I, I think that it really comes down to, are we saying it to cover up not being responsible? 
or are we genuinely saying it because you know is it sorry for not getting to this sooner i made a mistake like i did i made a mistake or i'm late and then in my example i i say it you know sometimes because i am like gosh how am i so behind <laughs> even though oh, they didn't expect it you know Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we are out of time now, um, but thank you so much for the the great presentation. Um, it resonates with myself and I'm sure many of the others on the call here. Um, so thank you very much for the time and the presentation, uh, Deidre. Absolutely.